right. And this thing, is it on? The mic. Oh, yeah, it's gone. Yes. Okay. Uh, good evening. Good evening. I hope you can hear me. Uh, the Vice Chancellor uh, of the University of Johannesburg, Professor Mbedi. Our host, the host with the most. Um, the chairman of the Map or oh, <clears throat> Chairman of the Mapungubwe Institute Board of Governors, Professor Vil Komo, and the other colleagues from Mapungubwe that are here, the executive director, Joel Netisenze. Dr. Claudel Fanek, Professor Shirin Mutala, Dr. Peter Wundler, and those that are joining us online. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, my name is Oyama Mabandla. I am the chairman of the Council of Advisors at MISTRA, and I will be your host and program director tonight. Um, I have been asked to ask everyone's phones to be put on silent. Uh, distinguished guests in the room and those joining online, um, we encourage online audiences to engage via the chat function throughout the event. We will be live posting throughout the event, mostly on Twitter. Audience members can engage with us by tagging us and using our hashtag. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to hand over the baton for, you know, uh, for this unfolding program to the VC, Professor Litlo Kwa George Mpedi who will do the proper opening of tonight's event. After which I'll come back to introduce, you know, the keynote uh, uh, speaker who's flown all the way from Tokyo, Professor Marwala. And after he's done his thing, I will then introduce Dr. Refilwe Lipere and Arthur Goldstack, who are the respondents. After that, uh, I will hand over to Professor Basso Nzende, who will facilitate the question and answer session with the audience here and those joining us online. So without further ado, Professor Mbedi, I invite you to come on stage to open this event. Thank you very much, uh, pro program uh, director. For a moment, I was wondering, you know, your name, o Oyama. Um, I, I was a karateka, you know, and I know it's not about me, but since our brothers in Japan, my style was Kyokushin Kaikan, Oyama Karate. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, I wondered. Uh, we have a lot to talk about. <laughs> Thank you so much. I know it's not about us and karate that I couldn't help it. Um, Mr. Joel Netchenze. Executive Director, Mistra, um, my brother, of course, you're also my brother, <laughs> Professor Chilizi Marola, United Nations Undersecretary General and Rector of the United Nations University, Professor uh, Vil Nkomo, Chairperson, Mistra Board, Mr. Oyama Mavanda, Chairperson, Mistra Council, Senior Leaders of the Great University of Johannesburg, colleagues, uh, Board and Council Members of Mistra, our respondents uh, this evening, Dr. Rifilo Lepere, President of the HSS Alumni Association, uh, Mr. Arthur Goldstock, a founder of Worldwide Works, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening. 
It is a great honor to welcome you to this year's Mapungube lecture. This, this, year's, um, this year holds particular significance. The lecture will be given by the University of Johannesburg's former Vice Chancellor, <laughs> Professor Chilitsi Marwala. I joked earlier, I said, do you miss this place? He said, no. Nah. I said, yeah, it's mine now. <laughs> Prof. Marwala was the second vice chancellor of this great university, and I'm the third vice chancellor. So I inherited a great deal from Prof. Marwala. I learned a lot, having shadowed him, and I continue to learn a lot from him in terms of leadership and all the exciting things. Um, one thing that I really have to acknowledge is that it is Prof. Marwala who heightened my interest, you know, in technology, artificial intelligence, and also opened one's eyes to say, the fact that one is a lawyer doesn't mean one cannot combine law with technology and address issues of the day. As he always says, like artificial intelligence, the fourth industrial revolution has everything for everyone, you know, which is true, even for lawyers. So, ladies and gentlemen, my first year as vice chancellor has been um, has been incredibly. This is has been incredible. Let me put it this way, and this is in part due to the legacy left uh, by Prof. Marwala. His focus on the four IR and its capabilities and the introduction of Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, as metrics we should consider at an institutional level and, and beyond. So this is extremely important. And I feel very, very fresh after he has, um, you know, put this pin uh, on, on my chest and reminding me about the importance of universities working hard towards the realization of SDGs. So I'll wear this every day. I told him, I didn't want to put something like this on lest people think I'm imitating you. Now I can tell you the man himself Put it on me. And I'm looking who else has it, you know, in this room. So I feel very, very blessed and exclusive. So, I mean, the legacy of Prof. Marwala really goes beyond, you know, um, for IR and a lot of things, developing young leaders, myself included, and so on. So there is perhaps no one better poised to lead these technologies, you know, uh, to lead this conversation, apologies, around AI in South Africa and, of course, in the world. Uh, Prof. Morales' acute understanding of these technologies, his role in the United Nations, and his involvement in foreign policy in South Africa informed these views that I've just um, uttered. I have been particularly intrigued by this year's theme, ladies and gentlemen, the perils and welfare effects of artificial intelligence with South Africa. And, and I'm intrigued because, you know, one of my areas of specialization is about social welfare. So I wonder if Prof. Marwala will also bring in all his welfare in the broad sense, but we'll have to wait and hear the man himself. Indeed, as Prof. Marwala wrote for the Daily Maverick just last week, ladies and gentlemen, and I quote, as the world hurtles towards an increasingly digital future, the role of AI in shaping the destiny of nations cannot be overstated. South Africa, with its rich tapestry of culture and diversity, could harness AI's power to better its society, economy, and future. However, realizing this potential re requires a concerted effort from government, industry, and academia to foster innovation, inclusivity, and responsible AI practices. Delays in moving with AI trends and technological advances could be perilous. Legging is not an option in our current global context, close quote. Ladies and gentlemen, we are on the cusp of promise and peril, and there are distinct choices that we must now make in order to ensure that we are leveraging AI for good. There is a distinct need to co-create a purposeful and inclusive societal future within the reality of technology and constant innovation. Of course, you are at the right place. I say UJ innovates and others imitate Prof. Moral. Beyond its capabilities, AI is also about embracing a holistic approach that acknowledges the intricate web of societal, ethical, and environmental factors. This requires us, ladies and gentlemen, to invest in our people, foster innovation, ensure inclusivity, uphold ethics, and promote sustainability. This is really where the convergence of the 4IR and the Sustainable Development Goals lie. This is really, um, as I indicated, yes, where the convergence lie. At my inauguration at the beginning of this year, I quoted the Greek mathematician Archimedes, who once said, 
Give me a lever long enough and a fulcrum on which to place it, and I shall move the world. As I argued, in a contemporary context, the lever and fulcrum could be considered the convergence of these two areas, ladies and gentlemen. As Prof. Marola will undoubtedly demonstrate today, AI could very well be the key to South Africa's fortunes, in so much that it sparks growth and narrows our divides. I do not anticipate that our future as a nation is to wither, but if we are to avoid this fate, we must listen carefully to, can you guess, Professor Marwala's messaging and ensure that we are actioning these ideas. Listen carefully to the messaging and then action. Everybody hands on deck. Young or old hands on deck. Rich or poor hands on deck. Male or female hands on deck. Politically powerful or less powerful hands on deck. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the great University of Johannesburg. As I said earlier, this is a university that is your home, um, 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 Mr. Nechitenze. Uh, this is a home, uh, colleagues at Mistra and everyone out there. We say a home, in my language, say a home that doesn't receive guests is not a home. So it's almost the end of the year, but here at UJ, we're going strong. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to UJ. Thanks, Prof, for a, an exuberant and inspiring uh, welcome. <clears throat> and by the way, uh, you know, Professor Marwala, you know, is my friend. And uh, uh, about two years ago, he invited me to his private dining room uh, on a Friday. You know, <laughs> I, I expect, you know, to get that invitation from you as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, thank you, sir. Uh, <clears throat> it is my great pleasure and singular honor to introduce our distinguished speaker for the Mapunguwe Annual Lecture 2023, Professor Tilizi Marwala. Professor Marwala is the Rector of the United Nations University and Under Secretary General of the United Nations. He travels with diplomatic passport a position he has held since March this year. He is also a renowned scholar, author, and leader in the field of artificial intelligence and its applications to various domains. Born at Dutini village in the Limpopo province, he showed great academic potential early on and received scholarships to study abroad which led to a remarkable academic career. He obtained his Bachelor of Science degree, magna cum laude, in mechanical engineering from Case Western Reserve University, the great state of Ohio. His Master of Mechanical Engineering degree from the University of Pretoria, and his PhD degree from the University of Cambridge in the UK. He also completed management and leadership programs at Columbia and Harvard Business Schools. Before joining the United Nations University, Professor Marwala, as we all know, served as the Vice Chancellor and Principal of the University of Johannesburg. From 2018 to 2023, he was also the Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research and Internationalization between the years 2013 and 2017, and the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Engineering and the Built Environment between the years 2009 to 2013 at the same university. Prior to that, he was a full professor at the University of Witwatersrand from 2003 to 2008 as an associate professor, and then professor of electrical engineering he also held the Carl and Emily Patch Chair of Systems and Control Engineering and the South African Chair of Systems Engineering. From 2000 to 2001, he was a postdoctoral research associate at Imperial College in the UK. Professor Marwala 
has been a visiting scholar, professor at several prestigious universities in the USA, the UK, China, and South Africa. He has extensive academic policy, management, and international experience, and is a co-holder of five patents. His research has been multidisciplinary, involving the theory and applications of artificial intelligence to engineering, social science, economics, politics, finance, and medicine. He has served on a variety of global and national policy-making bodies and has worked with the United Nations entities such as UNESCO, UNICEF, the World Health Organization, and the World in, um, Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO. Professor Marwala is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the World Academy of Sciences, the Academy of Science of South Africa, and the African Academy of Sciences. He is also the recipient of 45 awards and honors, including the Order of Mapungubwe, South Africa's highest honor, the Academy of South Africa's the Academy of South Africa's Science for Society Gold Medal, and the 2021 IT Personality of the Year by the Institute of IT Professionals in South Africa. He has served as a deputy chair of the Presidential Commission on the Fourth Industrial Revolution, a body that advises the government on the opportunities and challenges of the digital era, and also a member of the Namibian Fourth Industrial Revolution Task Team. He has extensive record in human capacity development, having supervised 47 masters and 37 PhD graduates to completion. Some of these students have proceeded with their doctoral and postdoctoral doctoral studies at leading universities such as Harvard, Rutgers, Purdue in the United States, Oxford, Cambridge in the UK, British Columbia, and Concordia in Canada. Professor Marwala is the author of more than 20 books, including leadership lessons from books I have read, published in 2021, and leading in the 21st century, the call for a new type of African leader, published in the same year, dozens of book chapters, journal papers, and conference papers, and more than 200 magazine articles and newspaper op-eds. His latest book, Closing the Gap, The Fourth Industrial Revolution in Africa, was published in 2020, and is an accessible overview of the Fourth Industrial Revolution and the impact it is set to have on various sectors in South Africa and Africa. Professor Marwala is married to Jabuli Levuisi Lemanana, and together they have two sons and a daughter. Klonipo Katuchelo Marwala, Loazi Tendo Marwala, and the daughter, Mbali Denga Marwala. During his tenure at the University of Johannesburg, Professor Marwala made a firm commitment in partnering with Mistral to host the inaugural Mapunguwe Annual Lecture. Since 2012, the partnership between the organizations is still firm. The aim of Mistra's annual lectures is to provide intellectual discourse on global issues impacting on South Africa, Africa, and the world, and to stimulate public debate and policy dialogue. The topics of the lectures have ranged from democracy and governance to economic development and transformation, science and technology, and to culture and identity. Tonight, we are very privileged to have Professor Marwala as our speaker. His lecture is titled, The Perils and Welfare Effects of Artificial Intelligence with South Africa. He will explore the opportunities and challenges of artificial intelligence for South Africa and Africa, and the role of policy and leadership in harnessing its potential for social and economic development. Please join me in giving him a very South African welcome. Uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. 
Konnichiwa. <laughs> And I would like to acknowledge uh, the Vice Chancellor and my successor, uh, Professor Mbedi, uh, the Chairman of MISTRA, Professor Vil Ukomo, who actually came and picked me up at JFK Airport 33 years ago. And we drove all the way to Pennsylvania. Those were beautiful moments. Uh, Mr. Joel Nechitenje. Mr. Joel Nechitenje actually comes from a walking distance from where I live. And uh, I'm not here because we come from the same neighborhood. And of course, uh, Mr. Arthur Goldstack, the Filwe. And also uh, the residential coordinator of the United Nations in South Africa, Nelson Mufa, is also here. I'm actually quite excited to be talking about artificial intelligence. This is my 19th public lecture that I have given ever since I became director of United Nations. So I have completed all the, 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 the continents. Uh, of course, uh, Oceania is a big island uh, in this context. And I'm going to be talking about artificial intelligence. I uh, began to work in artificial intelligence when I went to Cambridge to do a PhD. And the reason why I started working in artificial intelligence was I was, I did not really know what I was going to do my PhD on. And then I sat next to Nando De Freitas, who is a senior uh, director at uh, Google DeepMind, he's actually a South African. And he told me that he was doing a PhD in artificial intelligence. And of course, uh, it sounded quite cool. That is how I got into artificial intelligence. But in many ways, artificial intelligence is an engineering field. So almost all the concepts that I later would explore, I had already learned uh, before. So I entered the PhD program in 1997. That's a long time ago. That's a long time ago for the technology that many people think is recent. In fact, it is not a recent technology. The first paper in artificial intelligence was published by Alan Turing in 1950. John McCarthy coined the term artificial intelligence in 1955. The perception that makes deep learning that is revolutionizing language and image processing was actually invented in the 60s. And its training had already been perfected by 1986. So what has changed? I think two things have changed. And I'm going to talk a little bit more uh, in my talk. And the first thing that has changed is that we have much more data today than ever before. When I was at Cambridge, the way in which you used to store information was using a stiffy drive. And the stiffy drive was 2.4 megabytes. I don't know whether what you can, what you can uh, use 2.4 megabytes for. And we had such huge amount of data that I did not know how I was going to even store it. And of course, just when, as I was finishing uh, the PhD 1999 to 2000, then came to the market, the zip drives. Uh, Dr. Professor Nzenze, you don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and the zip drive was a mega, 100 megabytes storage material, and I had so many of them. Today, I wouldn't even be able to know how to open them, you know. The CD-ROM was not even there. And of course, today, data is all around us. That's the first change that happened. And we'll talk about some of the policy issues that we are battling with when it comes to issues of data. The second issue was computational power. I used to run, I did a PhD on neural networks 
Uh, by the way, I also have to acknowledge uh, Professor uh, uh, Daniel Mashau, who did uh, a PhD in artificial intelligence at Brown University uh, when I was still an undergraduate uh, uh, student. And he actually did it on language models, Monte Cahiden Markov models. And we'll, we'll learn about hidden Markov models before the end, and you will be an expert when you tell me. <laughs> so the computational power, I used to run uh, my neural network overnight, and I will come back the following day and it will still be running. Today, and I used to run it on a cluster at the University of Cambridge, which was supposed to be a high performance cluster. Today, you will be able to run the same program in less than a minute on my laptop. Those are the two things that have actually changed. Now, what is this thing called artificial intelligence? Artificial intelligence is nothing but a technique to make machines think, act, and interact. And it uses mathematics and coding, which is quite important, but now, you can do quite a great deal of artificial intelligence without knowing either the mathematics or coding. It has been democratized. And many of the applications that we are seeing now, many of them are not necessarily developed by people who understand what the back propagation algorithm is all about. Alwani, it is not a name of a wine. It is a mathematical algorithm. And there are really three broad types of artificial intelligence. And of course, there is a handbook of machine learning that I wrote that you can go and buy. The first one is prediction ma machines that actually predicts. You know, you use it to predict what is going to happen. And of course, what they actually do, they rearrange information that already exists. And this is a very important point. And they will not be able to predict something that is not already represented in the data, the so-called black swan. So it can only predict the patterns that already exist in the data. And if you understand the concept of a function uh, where you input something, what you input is your observation into a model that was trained by information that all, all you had uh, gathered in the past. And what you get is really the rearrangement of what already exists. The second one is what is called the clustering machine, where you can use it to categorize a piece of data into categories. And the third one is the generative machine. Chat GPT is an example. A generative adversarial network is another example. So this is what is called a feed forward neural network. Because it has many layers, it is called deep learning. You can see layer one, layer two, layer three. And then you input something. It might be the weather in the last five days and the output might be the weather in the next five days. And that is why it is called a prediction machine, because it tells you what is going to happen into the future. And what are the challenge? The challenge is that to be able to do this, you need data. And data is not universally available. And I will uh, illustrate some of the examples that indicates the fact that the world is now being divided into two the data-rich countries, and the data-poor countries. And as the United Nations, we have the responsibility to bridge that data gap. And of course, another example, certainly in the developing South, is the issue of missing data. That the data is always missing, and missing data is a good data because at least you know it's missing and you can estimate. The worst problem is wrong data. 
that comes as right data and the impact of that on decisions, especially when we use these tools in order to make decisions. Now, this is an example of what is called the convolutional, the convolutional neural networks. And it is used for mainly for image processing. You want to know who the person is. And then of course, you can see it is a complex structure. The input will be somebody's image. The output might be who the person is. And to train this, you need to have examples. And if you don't have examples, these uh, systems can discriminate. At one stage, and there is Dr. Wongani Mulunga here, you can lift your hand. We visited a specific country that I am not going to mention because the last time I mentioned, I was not even a diplomat <laughs> and I had a diplomatic incident. So you arrive at this country, you put the part of your picture or your passport that is your picture. And you look at the camera. And all it does is to verify that the person it is seeing live is the person whose picture is on the passport. And the first person to go was me because I'm the vice chancellor. Uh, and then as I put and he uh, looks at me, says, I corner. I cannot verify. And then you have to go to a long queue. And then the second person to come was Oscar van Gerden. And then it allowed him. Mm. And then the third person was Wongani Mulunga from Maslabatini. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I called. <laughs> <laughs> then the fourth person was Peter Vig. It allowed him. And of course, this thing is discriminating against people of African descent. Of course, it is discriminating against people of African descent because the data was not collected neither in Masabatini or Dutuni where we came from. So you have a problem of data, but you also have a problem of computation, which I have talked about. The fact that these things actually require computation and the computation issue is actually a global geopolitical issue. And at the moment, the issue is about a specific type of computer chips called NVIDIA chips that are made by a company called in NVIDIA. Uh, that is an American company. And they are very, very crucial to build large language models. I don't have to explain. We do know that there are restrictions that certain countries cannot have access to this. And it is it also has a very complicated supply chain because the technology is American. The software that is used is American. But the devices that are used uh, to build uh, uh, these uh, 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 things that actually manufacture these chips are Dutch. And it is done in Taiwan, in, the, uh, in China. And uh, and in, uh, uh, in, in South Korea. So the decoupling is not quite straightforward. We do know that uh, President uh, Biden has invested $300 billion through something called the CHIPS Act. And the primary role of the CHIPS Act is to bring that whole uh, distributed value chain to United States. Of course, this requires a huge amount of computation. And we, we certainly, me and my colleagues, um, here is a book that was written by Tsakani Mongwe and uh, Rendani Mbuva from uh, uh, Google DeepMind and University of London, Queen Mary, on Hamiltonian Monte Carlo methods in machine learning. I can see uh, Daniel Mashau is already salivating. <laughs> To be able to, it's not a solution. The solution is that you must have faster chips. You will have to have faster chips. But we do know that uh, uh, chips are strategic and we don't want them to 
fall on rogue non-state actors or governments that are going to use this to destroy the world. This is an example of generative adversarial networks. And it's really a combination of neural networks. You see these pictures? These are pictures of people who have never existed. They were all made up. They look re realistic. You can create videos out of them. This is what you call fake data. By the way, fake data is not always bad. Some fake data is absolutely desirable. For those of us who have studied in, in medicine, I see uh, 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 Professor Rudolph, uh, you were in medical school, uh, dental school. Uh, they would have uh, pictures of people in anatomy classes. And because uh, uh, these are pictures of people who are not wearing anything, they will have to cover their faces. But now you can be able to generate realistic pictures. You don't have to cover people because they never existed. You don't have the dilemma of privacy. So this is a good example of the use of fake data. The bad example is when somebody uses a politician uh, saying things that they have never said so that you can undermine their political uh, trajectory. And this is both of the use. And of course, these generative adversarial networks are being used to train uh, models. According to the Gartner, I don't know whether to believe what Gartner is saying, but they are saying 60% of all AI is going to be trained using, in 2024, which is just around the corner, using synthetic data. And I will talk about some of the things that we have done on synthetic data. Now, I couldn't escape talking about chat GPT. And I did an experiment, chat GPT, open AI, versus BARD, which is uh, done by um, Google. So I went and gave it a very simple question. Who is Chi Ane Omarwala? Well, this is my grandmother. And then Chat GPT says, as of my last training data in 2001, there is no widely, I think suppose you wanted to say 2021. There is no widely recognized individual named Chiani Omar, but I was so disappointed. <laughs> Because obviously she's widely known in my, in our family, you know. <laughs> and then she says, it is possible that you are referring to Chiano Marada, the notable South African engineer and academic known for his work in artificial intelligence. He's confusing me with my grandmother. <laughs> and then I went to Google Bard, which obviously has access to all the Google di database, which is the richest database. So Chiano Marada is a traditional engineer, an artisan from Venda, South Africa. She was born in 1925. I don't know why it got that, but it, it actually got it right. And passed away in 2018. I wish she passed away in 2018, because she passed away in 1991. <laughs> wow. And the reason why it is saying she passed away in 2018 is because in 2018, here at the University of Johannesburg, I launched a Chiano Marwala scholarship. So it is assuming that that scholarship was launched shortly after she died. And this is the confusion of this system. And Chiano Marwala is not a complicated name for these systems. Imagine if the name is John Smith. There must be thousands and thousands and thousands of John Smith. How will it be able to discern which John Smith you are talking about. Of course, people are saying that uh, there is now a skill called, uh, a cohort of people called prompt engineers. These are people who are trained to be able to prompt these systems to be able to answer the questions in the right way. I hope 
ፕሮፌሰር ፔዲ ዩ አር ኤንድ ፕሮፌሰር ማሻው ዩ አር ቲንኪንግ አቦት ኢንትሮዱሲንግ ኤ ኳሊፊኬሽን ኢን ፕሮምፕት ኢንጂነሪንግ ባት देयर ኢዝ አልሶ ኤ ቢግ ኢሹ ሃው ዱ ዩ አሰስ ዘ አክዩሬሲ ኦፍ ሪተን ቴክስት ሃው well you know uh, uh, wherever you have numbers you can go and verify whether those numbers are correct maybe numbers are easier to verify but how about if it is written text and this is really the problem of our time and we will need to deal with it so artificial intelligence is here and we need to deal with it this is an example of the work that i did with uh, dr mbuva on the covid prediction of covid peak in south africa and we actually uh, uh, predicted it quite well uh, on time and here we are using what is called bayesian inference system you don't have to know exactly what bayesian inference system is but certainly you can see that it can actually be used to predict the peaks and this is another uh, on the side is the work that we did with um, Nadine Mohammed who was my student um, uh, of 15 years ago this is an ECEEG you no know, ECG signal that you use and you put it on the skull of a person and you can and doctors look at this and decide whether you have epileptic uh, activity or not and of course we train a neural network to be able to do that and it is able to detect epilepsy epileptic activity with accuracy of over 90% and it does not get tired and this performance does not depend on whether it has a headache or it slept for shorter hour than normal which is normally what happens to human doctors and 90% 90% accuracy is actually pretty good but if it was a different application a system in an aircraft 90% is not good enough mm. so you can see depending on what area you are actually working on you have different requirements so this is another example of the use of artificial intelligence to model hiv this was a vested interest in 2020 20, 20, 20 2013 no 2003 I went to Standard Bank oh you know uh, did I say Standard Bank no uh, yeah, I went to your bank <laughs> uh, to apply for the loan to buy a home and they do something called credit scoring and AI is able to do credit scoring better than a, a, a human uh, person and then they came back and say you qualify to become a a a, a, a home owner as i was excited they said no 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 but you need to get a life insurance to cover your debt in case you do not live enough long enough to be able to repay the loan i said give me the form they gave me the form i'm not going to mention the name of the organization that uh, uh, that, that that gave me the form and they said i should go and take hiv test i don't know whether you still remember when people had to go and take hiv tests in order to get life insurance so i went in and, and, and got uh, uh, an hiv test it went very well uh, but i was worried why so we de- we we decided to create a system that will be able to estimate that risk without telling people to go and take hiv test so we take a neural network and we train it with data that relates demographic characteristic to the risk of hiv so where were we, we going to get this data department of health they have anti natal database hundreds of thousands of database they take almost every measure you know how old is this person who has presented themselves to hospital uh, how many pregnancy they call it gravity gravidity uh, how many children are still alive um, called parity i might be mixing the two uh highest educational level and so on and so forth and then they as a matter of course they take an hiv test so you could train these models 
and you could train these models and they could actually be able to make the predictions. But the problem was that there were lots of missing information, which we ended up studying. Uh, missing information. In fact, uh, uh, the current CEO of the National Research Foundation was the PhD student, my PhD student, who actually worked on, on, on this uh, particular topic. And then I rushed to the insurance company. I said, I have a solution for you. And they said, wow, it is very accurate. I said, okay, yeah. But they said, but it is biased. I said, what do you mean? They said, you're using antenatal database, which is only female database. How will we use your system if a male presents themselves looking for the loan? Of course, uh, the only way we could do is to ask uh, 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 people to talk about their spouses, you know, in order to deal with that uh, data bias. So the problem of bias is actually quite a, an important one. The problem of missing data is also an important one. And this is another example of the work that I did with, um, uh, we actually have a US patent with uh, Megan Russell, who was our PhD student, David Rubin, Brian Vigdorovic and me. So this is a system when somebody loses their voice box, normally because of cancer, they remove the voice box, but they can actually still move their tongue. So what we were doing was to design this system so that uh, based on the movement of the tongue, we can be able to know what they are saying. And of course, based on the movement of the tongue, it ultimately becomes a signal, it goes to a neural network, and it is able to tell you what the person is saying. Now with a voice synthesizer, this is another good use of fake data. If we have the original voice of a person, we can synthesize a voice using the, 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 the voice of an individual. We all know about uh, uh, Stephen Hawking, a British physicist with an American accent. Now, with this technology, you and if you had his original voice, you can be able to create it in the original voice. Now, I'm going to talk about the parent. This is a bridge, a temporary bridge in Grayston Drive. It collapsed and killed three people. Still remember this thing? And now, can we be able to use artificial intelligence to have predicted this before it happened and saved life? And of course, when I talk about this, I'm reminded of my grandmother, who was really my first engineering teacher. She used to make clay pots. And then she would go to the river. Uh, young people don't know that clay is found in the river. She would go and select the best clay. When we were studying engineering, they would call that material selection. There are softwares to do that. My grandmother will do that without a software. And then after she, that, she'll come back and she'll make this clay pot. I'm sure, uh, uh, Professor Mashao, if you ask your students to make that clay pot, they will be asking for the software called computer-aided design. She could do that without computer aided design and she'll put it in the sun and allow it to cool uh, up, uh, no, uh, and, and allow it to, to dry. But of course it is not strong enough to be able to cook. Then she will go and put it in the fire mm -hmm. and allow it to cool very slowly. That cooling process is called annealing. There is an equation called the Boltzmann equation that describes how that cooling happens. She never knew who Boltzmann was, let alone his equation. But she knew the concept. She knew the concept that if you cool it too fast, it's gonna crack. And after that, she will knock each pot, listen to it. And she will say, if it rings for a long time, it's a good pot. When I was studying mechanical engineering, they will say, if it rings for a long time, it's a lightly damped structure. Mm -hmm. She never knew, she would never have known what that meant. And if it rings for a short time, it's not a good pot because it is damped, because maybe there is still water trapped, there might even be holes inside and so on and so forth. Perfect system. 
But as time goes on, we realize that he was throwing away good pots. He was throwing away good pots because as he was aging, a hearing was deteriorating. So I went to Cambridge to do a PhD on using artificial intelligence and vibration data to assess the integrity of structures. In fact, my PhD topic was uh, this is, is uh, fault identification using neural networks and vibration data. And of course, once you have that piece of software, certainly it's much more sensitive than a human uh, ear and it, its uh, efficiency does not deteriorate because it is getting old. And we could have used a system like this uh, to monitor structures. Not, you know, in a country like Japan, where you have many, many uh, earthquakes, they monitor absolutely everything. Uh, I did not fly from Japan. I flew from Dubai, but uh, from Dubai I was in Germany, and they were telling us that they are implementing this in Germany because they have to uh, replace or fix almost 80% of their bridges in the next uh, 10 years. And of course, these condition monitoring systems must be part of our of our laws. Now, I will come to the issue of economics. How did I get into economics? One of the big dilemma of engineering profession in South Africa is that people go and study engineering to go and work in a bank. And when I was at Vance University, students will say, but uh, can't we do a project where we are going to be able to model uh, the bank, uh, the some financial instruments? So we worked on options and derivatives. Uh, we worked on financial forecasting, uh, customer chain forecasting, credit scoring, demand and supply information, and so on and so forth. But the work that I'm going to highlight is the work that I did with my PhD student who is now at... Uh, Standards at Poor. He actually worked for Mistra, uh, Evan Hewitz. I don't know whether you still remember Evan Hewitz. And Evan Hewitz was looking at what does artificial intelligence do to economic theory? I mean, let's just look at the concept of demand and supply. And we have done this study. We go to uh, Amazon. I am in Johannesburg, my colleague in, in uh, Brazil, and we buy the same book at the same time. Maybe not exactly the same time, but more or less the same time. And we get two different prices. Why? Well, it is quite simple for those of you who have studied economics. Pricing is derived from what is called the equilibrium point of demand and supply. And when you go to pick and pay, it is aggregate demand and aggregate supply. And what it is actually doing, uh, Amazon, is that instead of using aggregate demand, it is using your own demand because it has observed your buying patterns. Of course, big revelation. I told one of my, uh, so, uh, Mr. Surat Khan, I told uh, him, I say, hey, you know, this is fantastic thing. We have discovered, uh, see, this system is giving us individualized demand. This is new. I said, no, this is not new. In Delhi, when you go to the market, when you negotiate a price, what is actually happening? They are synthesizing your individual demand curve so that they can give you the price that you deserve. Of course, uh, these systems are actually changing economics, whether it is the issue of information asymmetry, whether it is the issue of the efficiency of the market, and so on and so forth. Now, artificial intelligence is actually healing the concept of truth and facts. This is another work that we did with uh, Evan Hewitt. Uh, which was covered by New Scientist in 2007. So we built this software called Aiden that learned how to play poker. And we just allow it to play so many, many times. And after a while, we realized that it has learned how to bluff. And I am not bluffing. 
<laughs> now, if it can learn how to bluff and we have systems that are evolving, what does it mean? I do, we don't know what it meant. We were not investigating that. But if these systems can learn without being prompted to bluff, and they are becoming much more autonomous, where is the control switch to make sure that that bluffing is not a serious bluffing that has existential consequences for all of us? And then the global peace, the issue of peace and security. I like this work. Artificial intelligence can be used to predict interstate conflict. And of course, now you can actually be able to go to social media and mine the data and be able to come up with indicators of the state of peacefulness in a region for all sorts of reasons, but I think importantly to be able to prevent conflict. We wrote a book and which was translated into Mandarin. I was very interested to know how they are going to pronounce my name in Mandarin, write my name in Mandarin. It turns out that Ma is a horse. Wa, but they don't say Wa, they say Wa, is a gutter of a roof. La is to pull. So in many ways, I am the puller of horses from the gutter of roofs. I don't know what that means. <laughs> now, I have to now uh, come to the conclusions. Artificial intelligence is really a tale of two cities. And for those of you who have read the book, Charles Dickens, it was the age of wisdom, but it was also the age of despair. And whether it becomes the age of wisdom depends entirely on what we do. It depends on what we do as individuals, as organizations, as countries, and so on and so forth. And as the United Nations, we are worried about its impact on privacy and security and security and surveillance. We are worried about its consequences in terms of bias and discrimination. We are worried about the fact that it is actually not transparent. It can give you a good idea why you shouldn't give an individual a loan, but it will not be able to tell you why. And of course, I'm reminded of this. And I said this when I was uh, uh, reflecting on the book, uh, Mosquito to Baobab, that was written by the vice chancellor of uh, uh, the University of Johannesburg, where he was uh, drawing leadership lessons from African sayings. And I actually couldn't help to realize that artificial intelligence gives us knowledge. It does not give us wisdom. So that step of taking knowledge to wisdom is still a step that we need to find out how it is going to be done? Is it going to be done by technology? Uh, what is the role of human beings? What is the role of technology? And so on and so forth. It turns out that if the algorithm is explainable, it is not accurate. If it is not explainable, it is more accurate. The issue of job security, the issue of accountability when, uh, when autonomous systems take decisions that are illegal, who is responsible? Uh, and what regulations do we need to put into the picture? Now I'll come to South Africa. I was the deputy chair of the Fourth Industrial Revolution Commission. And we proposed these recommendations. Uh, they were spot on. The first one, educate South Africa on AI. And I have to commend the University of Johannesburg for being the first university to introduce the compulsory AI course for everybody. 2018, 
and they get a separate certificate. The second one established the National AI Institute. I don't know how it is working, but it was established at the University of Johannesburg and TUT. We launched it last year. Use AI to re-industrialize South Africa. Part of the reason why South Africa is de-industrialized is because we have not invested in the technology of production. And those who have uh, invested into technology of production are much more productive and efficient and they are able, able to produce goods at a lower price. And South African consumers is not a fact, no consumer anywhere is patriotic. They don't buy things because they were made in South Africa. They buy things because of a good price and a good quality. Develop a data institute because data is, it is really about data. Incentivize the adoption of AI, build AI infrastructure, the infrastructure of computing, the high performance computing facility at the CSR is a good example. And we have used it quite extensively. Educate lawmakers on AI. Currently 67 countries have developed AI strategies. South Africa does not have an AI strategy. Just a few weeks back, the government of the United Kingdom uh, had an AI summit that was convened by the prime minister. And it came up with a recommendation that, uh, or they announced that they are going to use the IPCC model to regulate this technology. Uh, the president of United States, Joe Biden, issued an executive order on AI on the 30th of October. The government of China has issued guidelines on a, on a regulatory framework on AI. I think South Africa must come, must also uh, start thinking about this and also uh, develop implementation capacity. Now, what are we doing as the United Nations? Of course, the United Nations is not a perfect organization, but it's a very important organization. And in many ways, it moves by consensus. For example, the World Health Organization has developed AI guidelines in medicine. I was, are you telling me that I have run short of time? <laughs> no, 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 no. no. <laughs> yeah, because I'm, 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 I'm about to finish, by the way. Um, uh, the UNESCO Ethics of AI, uh, the ITU AI for Good, United Nations has the Scientific Advisory Board, which I am a member of. We just launched the High Level Advisory Board on AI. The Secretary General uh, issued it in a, in, in a press a briefing where I was also uh, present and I spoke. Uh, there is even a question of whether we should have an AI agency. Uh, the United Nations University has just developed a series of policies. The first one is the policy on the on synthetic data for sustainable development because data is quite important. And of course, also a policy on cross-border data. We take it for granted that data does not flow easily between borders. I cannot just take my medical record, which I should, to Japan because medical data is one of the things that you can't just move across borders. And of course, there are good reasons why. It might be somebody else's data. It might be, there might even be a virus in that database, and so on and so forth. And then obviously the issue of semiconductor chips. Uh, I think the semiconductor chips that, are, that have something to do with, uh, uh, that is in our smartwatches for health, uh, are not strategic and they should be available. So what is to be done? I think we should implement the four IR recommendations. I think we should invest in multidisciplinary education. I think we should create funding mechanism for AI related industries. I think we should identify good applications of AI. In fact, I think what we need to do is to maximize the good that comes out of this uh, technology 
while at the same time minimizing the bad that comes out of this technology. And those who, and, and those of you who have studied mathematics, you will know this is a multi-objective optimization. It depends on what you weigh, what is important for you. Is the good applications more important than being risk averse? It's a question of judgment. And of course, if I wanted to be bombastic, I would say you need to choose a point on the uh, Pareto frontier. Uh, of course, for those of you who studied optimization, you know what I'm talking about. And that we also should support develop AI laws, policies, and regulations. And we should support international developments in AI, especially the ones that are being developed by the United Nations. Thank you very much. I know I have spoken more than you have given in the time. Thank you very much. Uh, colleagues, another round of applause for, for what was a torrentially eloquent, rigorous, funny, and accessible address. Now, I don't know about you, I, speaking for myself, my intellect has gone up a tad, you know, <laughs> after this encounter, you know. That's not artificial. You know? <laughs> I think if I had to take an IQ test, you'd see, you know, <laughs> a bump. And, you know, AI is the preoccupation of our age. I think, you know, um, this is something that we have to know. This is something that we have to engage with. And Professor Marwala and UJ, I think are doing a great job, you know, in that demystifying it, you know, making it accessible as a tool for advancement as a species. Uh, of course, take into account its perils because um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a new technology and we do know that it's been also used in a malevolent way. As Professor Marwala said, someone can just you know, start a, a campaign, political campaign, a, a, a masquerading as someone else to damage that person. So those are some of the things that, you know, have to be engaged with, you know, the regulation, uh, the regulatory framework to make these technologies safe and usable, you know, for all of us. Uh, colleagues, um, those who are online, please do tweet. Uh, and the Twitter handle is Mistra underscore SA. Mistra underscore SA. We want to hear your views on what has been a capaciously erudite address. Now I'm moving on to the respondents, the people who will be responding to this um, wisdom and uh, uh, erudition we've just been. Um, you know, served with. And uh, those two people is Dr. Rufilo Lipere and Arthur Goldstruck. I'm going to go through, Rufilo, you'll, part, you'll pardon me. I know your, 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 your bio is quite extensive, but for in the interest of time, I'm going to truncate it. Dr. Rufilo Lipere is an acclaimed and award-winning creator, the researcher, narrative strategist, drama therapist, and writer. Her extensive expertise spans across various academic and professional domains, emphasizing her role as a transdisciplinary scholar who employs narrative and creativity as essential research tools. With over a decade of experience, she has probed deeply into gender and performance research consistently unearthing profound insights into systemic inequality. She's an educator at Swane University of Technology, where she teaches African performance studies, directing and script writing. Dr. Lipere's contributions to academia and the arts transcend national borders. She has delivered guest lectures at prestigious institutions like Howard University, Georgetown University, and New York University, and reaching the discourse on black feminist aesthetics, drama therapy, and the transformative power of storytelling and interpretation in our society. Her work seamlessly weaves historical context, statistics, 
and personal narratives to address vital topics such as social justice, trauma, the intersectional identities of black women, and the performance of labor. Dr. Rifilwe Lipere's remarkable journey as a multifaceted scholar and advocate continues to inspire and shape the future of research, strategy, and the arts, both in South Africa and on the global stage. Her unwavering commitment to addressing pressing social issues and promoting creative expression underscores the exceptional contributions to multiple fields of knowledge. Dr. Lipere, the stage is yours. Thank you. Wow, um, thank you so much. Um, thank you for the invitation, Prof. Um, truly inspired of your presentation, your articles, your books, your works, really excited. And when I was asked um, to come and respond, you know, you have that moment of like, eh, <laughs> me, eh, okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> um, but uh, I really want to appreciate and So I'd like to really take the moment and really thank the program director, Mr. Oyama, Prof. Mbedi for hosting us, uh, Prof. Marala for brilliant work, um, Prof. Will Ngomo, thank you so much. The Mr. Jonah Shitende, thank you a lot. The board, the council of MISTRA, the virtuosic staff of MISTRA that made this all possible, um, and the team that is here for creating this space for all of us to really sit and really dream and think together. And what Prof has offered us is not only just a moment of education, because I also was in excited about the an amount of knowledge that one can get from Prof, but also to really imagine what protocols can be observed in these moments, but also what avatars that AI offers us. So I'm a performer and I think a lot around role and role method and the idea of setting stages. So in the idea of a dramaturgy of personhood and humanity, I'm thinking here around, in dramaturgy, we think of a stage, you set a stage, you think of the role that is there, the scripting that happens, and the possibility of costuming it. And I, I wanted to, to really respond back to Prof's work and the piece that he's um, really offered us today in that way, to think about this as he has offered us a stage and that the world is vast, the world is big, the world of 4IR is so much that it is allowing us to imagine what this revolutionary world could be. So, um, and part of what also Prof is doing is simply using the idea of radicalizing, grasping at the root of something and saying, how do we radicalize an activity a pro and thing that we are all engaged in right now. I mean, a lot of times as intellectuals, uh, we think, actually, I'm not, I'm not part of what the masses are doing. But a lot of us have our 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 knowledges, our being. If you are on Twitter, if you have Netflix, if you have any of these things, you are engaging in the work. And already when Prof has made it so easy for us to access, to open up that door that is bolted for a lot of us, but to understand where is it. To so part of the discussion that he's given us is the discussion of a paradigm shift, that we may understand the processes that transcend the conventional ways and boundaries of understanding artificial intelligence, that we may navigate these complexities and the transformative power of AI, not only as international relations, but as an imperative knowledge of making that we've all have experienced as an academic, we all had that epistemic break when chat GPT became a thing and we all had a bit of hal palpitation. But what Paul, Prof is saying amongst us, that there's a call to change that echoes through our systems and structures that emphasizes not only the decolonial project that we are all engaged in, but also advance an unprecedented pace of development. We are asked to go into, uh, you know, those who drive, you are asked to go into gear six. He said to us, like you are moving from one to six. So we are in gear six. And in this face of this, fast-paced development, what is it, this looming um, development, what about economic disparity, 
he's asking us. What about the looming climate crisis, he's asking us. Where does AI emerge as a potential great definer, a force that could shape the trajectory of our future? So Prof has given us, the benefits of AI are undeniable. Our focus though has to extend beyond its advantages and its ethical considerations. So here I move from stage to role. What is the avatar that we are given around AI? That AI, it is conceived as a contemporary avatar, one that is interchangeable, that shifts with whoever wants to use it, one that is offering you dynamic leadership, new dynamic concepts of power. It is that AI, I don't know if um, any of you play PS, right? Um, PS, anyone? You have an avatar, you choose your, no one plays PS. <laughs> or you, or when you were younger, you played, oh look at, oh look at. You choose your player, you choose your fighter, right? You choose your fighter. So what those places give us is the concept of choice. But AI is saying to us, there is a different kind of choice, that there is a potential of an avatar and the dynamic concept of this choice is that it's not that you're just choosing it. It also chooses for you. So in the face of economic disparity in, in a country like South Africa, do we truly understand the systems, the transparency of the systems, the bedrock of it and building trust and ensuring accountability? Prof showed us that the data challenges that are emerging are critical, the critical aspect of AI, the encompassing issues of collection, quality, privacy, bias. They are the use of this, our data, us who are consumers, who is data, us who are creators, who is data, and us are the ones who are going to be users, who is also the data. So what does it mean in this conjunction of real data, when data is not only the zeros, the ones, the one, one, zeros and ones, but it is real, robust, ethical presence of humans. What does it mean, therefore, when AI disrupts our livability, our industries? So we are excited. We are amazed and excited about the possibility of reshaping industries, of standardizing regulation, of addressing ethical concerns. But the actors and the writers are woken us to the perils of it, that the possibility of my face being used for many years beyond my life, what happens? Who am I? Am I still as ethical? Is it that me? What are we doing and what is to be changed? And how do we imagine this computational content and the idea that language can happen? So in the concept of scripting, and so we think of scripting as coding and we code ourselves, I want us to reflect a little bit about the concept of AI as a performer. AI as a, the idea of us engaging with it in social relations and understanding of the world. To not only engage with it as the excitement and the revolutionariness of it that it will bring about a different world, but what is it asking us to perform? So one of the big things that is performing us who come from that generation of the belief um, of citizen, can no, no, okay. <laughs> the belief of the promise that the 90s gave us when we were all, remember that time of World Wide Web, <laughs> right? When we were all in chat groups and, uh, and the belief and the promise of the World Wide Web was a, de a democratic world a world where powers that be will be and gatekeepers and the biases and the, uh, the, the way that the powers that be and the gatekeepers and institutions of power hold powers and broadcasters, for example, for us, it's the broadcasting, it's the big uh, production houses for different um, um, industries. It is the powers that be that hold power, hold capital and how the World Wide Web offered us the possibility of democracy. In journalism, we talk about citizen journalism. Right at the beginning of when I started becoming a journalist was this big rant about everyone now has access and we can all report. We are all accessible. We can do it. It is us. However, we are now here. The platforms that we have created, the platforms that have established these low barriers of access, these low barriers of submissions and acceptance, the platforms where we are 
becoming offers of repository and data are also the platforms that control and over-determine our everyday living, breathing moments. The platforms that we have believed that they are the ones who are going to bring us freedom have removed the necessity and entering, uh, have removed the concepts of what does it mean to be free. Yes, we no longer in my own mother's garage and my mother's little bedroom or my own little bedroom with my PS5 sitting there. Yes, the pressure on having to be advantageous and attract your own and create talent by yourself without having to have an agent is, of course, delicious and appealing. Of course, these spaces have offered us, the, the, as, as Prof was saying, the two cities, the beauty of the two cities, reducing uncertainty and giving us a performance of what it means to be a commodity. It has also offered us audiences that we had never dreamt of, internalization where you have, I mean, some of us have got consumers that are beyond the borders of your own little town. For the longest time, you only had the people in your town, but now you are encountering international audiences. I mean, the, the way that the world views South Africans, it is quite interesting that you're like, oh, is that who we are? Um, so when we are offered this possibility, when we are offered these beautiful avatars that Prof has given us, when we are offered this profitability of possibility also, when we have offered also the certainty associated with what it means to become a commodity, how else do we imagine now that we are an algorithm, now that we are the gatekeeper, now that we have vacated that role of gatekeepers, how do we then find ourselves in the burden of choice? How do we increase our own potentiality to combine not only being a consumer, but being a creator, but also being um, the data. Prof talked about the multidisciplinarity and that the importance of multidiscipline education in terms of really how do we imagine a new world with, with the data. And this I want to suggest as, I don't know how much time I have and who do I look at to know who <laughs> my time is. <laughs> I, can go. I can go, all right. So. What, um, what Prof is also offering us is that the material performativity of AI means that therefore the registry of power does not sit outside of us, but sits within us. The registry of power is set as a technical and a social practice that we are able to really create and imagine new politics and new culture. So what does it mean for you and me to exercise power? What does it mean for you and me to exercise a highly organized capital system backed by a vast system of extraction and logistics. How, what does it mean to be part of the supply chain? What does it mean to be wrapped up around the entire planet and be part of it, whether you're the center or whether you're a maker, whether you're a creator, whether you're a consumer? Prof reminded us that there's a promising and a there's a promising way of creating a deep learning of this technology that exemplifies a reality that AI has an impact on politics. It has impact in blurring the lines between truth and deception. He highlighted the ethical implications are profound, requiring stringent guidelines to address the misuse of this technology. So therefore, what would it mean to embody in this world of post-truth, we've been thinking through and imagining what does it mean to embody post-truth? What does it mean to engage with the idea of infrastructure, logistics, histories, classifications, human labor, and what the AI system is also asking us? What does it mean to be human? AI systems are not autonomous. They are not autonomous. They are neither they're not autonomous, and I'm saying this to say, they're not autonomous as they're able to, they're not autonomous or rational or able to discern, but with us in our training and us training them and us giving them our lives, our data, we are then allowing them to become rational, discerning, extensive in their intensity. So 
The challenges of truth take center stage. The AI learns to deceive us. It manipulates information. How do we become vigilant? How do we find the changing of conflict? How do we harness it for our own military applications? But more importantly, I think, Prof, I want to go back to the SDG, the Sustainable uh, Development Goals. What are the pursuit of those human rights that AI can offer us in both in the promise and its peril? So there are these, na the nature of training it with large data. What is the implications for the environment? What are the implications for us in sustaining the world that we're living in? What are the implications of what it means to be human and the promise of it being that our lives, our being, our trusts, and our desires are being shaped by it. While producing more capital and exploitation, for example, what does it bring if we are thinking about what it means to be human in the next 10 years, if we are bent on maintaining and growing a status quo that is about capital and profit? I'm wondering, and I'm thinking with you, and I'm wondering with you, that as we are creating um, laws and a strategy as a country, what does it mean for the precarious and the proletariat? What is this narrative that we are creating as we move forward by revolutionizing and, and revolutionizing our conditions of work? What does it mean to be both, as, I, as I've been saying the whole night, to be a data, to be a worker, but be data, to be a, a human, but be data? And in closing, I want to challenge all of us that as we are excited with the revolutionary instrument of this production, as we are fomenting ourselves with security and the possibilities of freedom, as we are thinking about this constant shakeup and that the world could be otherwise, and the avatar and the role and the stage that we are setting forth for the world, as we are also delayed just a little bit, and I think delayed is not, you know, I'm from church, I'm not one of those people, but Uncle Kero King, delay is not denial. So perhaps we are delayed, but perhaps the delay is giving us a moment of pause, a moment of us to live in the precarious and to think about with the precarity of the part-time gig economy, to think with and for ourselves as we are thinking about these ideas, these data-hungry, data-generating, data-anxious, how do we find our own revolution within that? How do we fuel this consumption, but at the same time, find that we are critically engaging? How do we not further and further ourselves into anxiety, but also create a global growing expansion of not only a people, but also a freedom that means all workers, all people are seen as one. Thank you so much, and I really appreciate the opportunity, the moment to be able to respond. Um, and I'm hoping for further conversations around this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Dr. Rafilo Lipere, another round of applause, please, for me. I think, I think Rafilo, and in fact, all of the speakers have shown that ideation and intellection doesn't have to be boring. There's been a dynamism, you know, abroad, you know, tonight, from the VC to Prof. Marwala to, to Rifilu. It's been quite a dynamic, you know, evening, and uh, thank you for that. Now I'm going to move to the last of the respondents, uh, Arthur Goldstuck. And Arthur Goldstuck is the founder of Worldwide Works, South Africa's leading independent technology market research organization, and an award-winning writer, author, analyst, and technology commentator. In 2013, he was presented with a distinguished service in ICT award by the Institute of IT Professionals of South Africa. In 2021, was elected to the Southern African Speakers Hall of Fame, and in 2023, to the Southern African Educators Hall of Fame for his work in training and mentorship. He leads worldwide works research into all aspects of the impact of digital, digital technology on business and consumers. Among other, its Cloud in Africa project won the business to business marketing category 
of the 2019 Sabre Awards Africa. In 2022, the Global Insights Community, ESOMA, named him to the Insights 250 Honor Roll of the world's top innovators in market research, enterprise intelligence, and data-driven marketing. His latest book, the, Hitchers, the Hitchhiker's Guide to AI, was released five days ago. Thank you, Arthur. And right away, this point. Thank you so much. It's a true honor to be asked to respond to this lecture. Prof. Marwal and I have been trying to work together or collaborate for quite a few years since the release of his uh, current book. And I'm very honored to see both of our books on sale in the entrance hall. That's a shameless plug for buying uh, the book. <laughs> but uh, before I start, I would like to present uh, Professor Marwal with a copy of the Hitchhiker's Guide to AI. Uh, 33 years ago, I was working for a feisty little newspaper called the Weekly Mail, which had a vision of changing this society. And all of those who were part of it would like to think that we played a role in our society uh, was changed. But one of the unusual things that happened there was that we realized that technology was a critical component of working towards a better society. And we became the first publication in South Africa to carry a uh, special technology section aimed at the non-technical uh, reader. Um, that became PC Review, which also was the first publication um, in Africa to cover the internet in a mainstream publication. Uh, that led to the writing of my first technology book called The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Internet, not the galaxy, but uh, it was also advising people don't panic, just as in The Hitchhiker's Guide uh, to the Galaxy. But the point there was that by using um, the technology available to us and by disseminating information using technology and with the weekly mail being the first uh, publication in Africa to have an email newsletter, uh, uh, for example, we were ready to embrace the internet when it arrived and embrace it fully to an extent that took many other publications uh, many years. And in the same way, uh, Prof Marwala's work on AI has put us in a position to be ready for the sudden explosion of generative AI in the past year. But the prop has been working on it for decades. It's um, nothing new. In fact, to give you a sense of how not new it is, um, I'd like to quote from a book written a few years ago, which described an engine for improving speculative knowledge by practical and mechanical operations. This contrivance made it possible that, and I quote, the most ignorant person at a reasonable charge and with a little bodily labor may write books in philosophy, poetry, politics, law, mathematics, and theology with the least assistance from genius or study. That's chat GPT, right? That comes from Gulliver's Travels, written in 1726. <laughs> That's how far back the vision for artificial intelligence uh, goes. Um, but uh, Prof, Prof Marwala and myself have two things in common. We both come from very small villages. In my case, from Spurk in the deep south of the Free State that I know probably two people in the audience have heard of. And it might be because you drove past the turn off to Tromsberg on the highway going down to uh, Cape Town. Um, but we also both have a passion for AI. And I don't think it's a coincidence. Um, in my book, I state several times that the difference between innovation in Silicon Valley and innovation across the African continent is this. In Silicon Valley, innovation is driven by opportunity. Across Africa, 
innovation is driven by need. To put it in another way, in Silicon Valley, it's about what is possible. In Africa, it's about what is necessary. And I would argue that growing up in a small town or a small village or in a rural area, we would have been deprived of the means of technology and innovation, but we were exposed constantly in our daily lives to what was needed because it is so visible what is lacking in poor communities, in rural communities, that is not as visible in the city. And that gives one a, th a thirst for the ability to address uh, those needs. And we've never seen a situation uh, or we've never seen a solution that is so geared to meeting the needs of modern society as artificial intelligence. Within that need, however, we can also observe the true impact of the digital divide. We know about the education crisis um, in this country. There are fairly alarming stats that show that less than 10% of uh, South Africans of school going age uh, reach uh, a tertiary or TVET uh, institution. It's not as bad as, as it looks, it's worse. It's much worse because of that seven or eight percent who do go past the school level, most of them are still going into education or training that is gearing them to the current needs of society and not the future needs of society. They're not being prepared for a digital uh, future. They're not being prepared for a future where AI is going to, in a, uh, to a very large extent, dictate how their work is going to be performed. That's why the vision that, <clears throat> excuse me, the vision that Prof Marwala had for introducing AI as a compulsory subject at uh, UJ five years ago is uh, so profound and uh, so uh, powerful because it shows that already then it was clear to visionaries like Prof Marwara that uh, this is a technology and a potential solution that will change every aspect of uh, society. If you think about the doctor today, for example, I won't name names because um, I'm scared of what you might do in my next examination, but certain GPs, for example, resist technology tooth and nail. The very idea of using AI to help them with a diagnosis or a prognosis is anathema uh, to them. Rather than seeing it as their partner, as their co-worker or collaborator, which is what AI is going to be, whether we like it uh, or not, but we will actually like it when every one of us has an AI collaborator at our side. One of the most common visions that I hear for the future of AI is that every student or school um, pupil will have a tailored AI expert at their side on their smartphones, maybe in an earpiece uh, that contains everything the smartphone has today that will guide them in their learning, not replace their learning, but guide them, support them, help them along, and where they have learning difficulties, understand the specific needs of the specific individual. That's the power of AI in the future. The teacher today who resists digital tools to teach their students, which is commonplace, is also the teacher of tomorrow who refuses to acknowledge the benefits that AI can bring to the learner. And who suffers in the end? First, the learner, but secondly, society um, as a whole, because people aren't being taught to the best of the ability of the system to uh, teach them. You can also look at the accountants, and I'm sure a few of you have accountants who resist technology. They're being dragged kicking and screaming into um, the era of cloud computing accounting. But uh, there too, AI will replace many of the current functions of bookkeepers in particular, and will require accountants to become guides to the business rather than simply someone who tallies up uh, the numbers and makes sure that you're compliant with um, the receiver of revenue. They truly have to be the guide to the business and AI in turn becomes their guide to guiding the business. Those are just two examples, two very obvious examples of how 
um, technology is being resisted today and will probably be, be resisted tomorrow despite the obvious benefits that it gains. And what it tells us is that we have to open our minds to uh, this technology rather than learn how to use it. If we open our minds to it, we don't have the mindset that it's the enemy. And like Prof. Malwara's initiative to start teaching everyone on uh, the basics of AI and what it means uh, for them back in uh, 2018, we need that for all of society to understand what AI can uh, do for them. The Prof spoke of three types of AI, which I'll sum up as, um, and forgive me for bringing this down to my level, but patterns, predictions, and generative um, AI. And the current revolution we're seeing is around generative um, AI. At least that's what people are currently talking about in the mainstream media and in mainstream uh, conversation. Um, but we have seen the patterns aspect of it, the ability to find patterns in data already transform many uh, sectors like cybersecurity, risk management, and in particular, fraud prevention. Banks use that pattern recognition of AI and machine learning as a, a fundamental element of their risk management and preventing fraud in their um, environments. But it's that other one. We spoke about patterns. We spoke about generative AI. It's the third one that I believe is the most exciting for the future, and that is uh, the predictive capabilities of AI. The prof spoke about the fact that um, it's not truly predictive at present because it can only draw on the information that is at its disposal and it hasn't got information from the future. But as AI becomes more powerful and is able to extrapolate more um, accurately and more quickly on what the current data will probably lead to, it's uh, likely to uh, become the next uh, revolution in what AI can do for us in terms of solutions uh, to our needs. So um, I truly believe that the potential of combining and evolving um, predictive AI with generative AI with uh, pattern uh, recognition is uh, going to aid us in addressing the perils of AI as well. Because while we can never forget the negatives, the potential damage, the biases, um, the misuse of AI uh, and uh, the like. It's where it's going to help us further in addressing the um, needs of society that it'll truly come into its own. Uh, the foreword to this book, by the way, is written by um, one of uh, Prof. Malwara's former students, uh, Benjamin Rossman, who's now a professor at uh, WITS uh, uh, in AI, who says that um, the wonderful thing about AI is that uh, most problems can be solved if you throw enough intelligence at it. And that's what AI will bring to that uh, particular uh, equation. We ask what jobs it will destroy. And I believe we will be able to ask AI itself what jobs it will destroy in the future. But it's not quite ready for that because AI only knows what it knows, so to speak. And it doesn't know what we don't know and what it doesn't know yet. But as more data is brought to bear uh, on the issue, AI will become more adept at predicting which jobs um, AI itself will do away with and which jobs it's going to need more help with. And that will allow us to plan for the future as well. Um, and certainly, um, while ChatGPT uh, right now can actually give us some great answers on uh, how current jobs will be transformed by AI. It's actually just guesswork at the moment. It's very good guesswork, but it's still just guesswork. You have to fact check every single thing that generative AI uh, tells us. And I do believe that a combination of generative and predictive AI should be able to give us um, actionable answers to these and similar uh, questions. We also face the risk of reduced self-reliance and critical thinking. But I want to quote the warnings of a legendary media critic from the 90s, Neil Postman, who wrote in a book in 1992, so pre-commercial internet. It was called Technopoly, The Surrender of Culture to Technology. And he wrote, 
The internet is a wonderful tool for acquiring information. It is not a very good tool for learning. Learning requires thoughtful reflection, and the internet is designed for rapid consumption of information. As a result, the internet is making us more acquisitive and less discursive. We are becoming a nation of know-it-alls who cannot think. Does that sound familiar from this year's headlines about AI? It's exactly what people are saying about AI. <clears throat> what in fact happened with the internet is that it became the most marvelous tool for enhancing our research. And I firmly believe that uh, 30 years from now, if we look back at the warnings of today, we'll also realize that in the same way, they were overblown and overstated because like AI, we cannot yet predict the future, but we can see the power of this technology. And I do believe that between generative and predictive AI, we can come up with numerous me mechanisms to counter the effect that Neil Postman uh, talks about. And part of that, though, is what Prof. Marwal was speaking about. And I would heartily endorse his call for collaboration, investment, and AI-specific infrastructure. Moreover, his call for multidisciplinary and multi-sectoral partnerships is a necessary and urgent imperative to address both the needs and the perils of AI. But we must use AI as a partner in this process. The humans must set in process the, uh, and in motion um, the um, ideals we're talking about. AI must assist then in pattern matching, content generation, and impact prediction. And after that, the humans must fine tune the outcomes in a way that is culturally sensitive and geographically sensitive, because those are nuances that will make or break um, the output of AI in the future. And AI cannot do nuances, or at least not yet. Um, finally, we have many needs in our society, but with the wisdom and experience and vision of the likes of Professor Marwala, and a little help from AI, we have the best chance yet of meeting those needs. Thank you very much. Another round of applause, please. Now, spoken like a true believer, I think you've drank the AI Kool-Aid. <laughs> I agree with you. Uh, colleagues, um, we are now entering a, a very important phase of our evening, which is uh, the question and answer session, which will be led by Professor Basson Zenze, you know, who is the, the head of uh, political science and international relations in uh, this university. Professor Zenze got his PhD at 24. I mean, he is a real whiz. <laughs> So we're happy to have him here. And um, earlier this year, he co-authored a book with uh, Professor Marwala, Artificial Intelligence and International Relations Theories, which was published by Springer. It was their second book together following their 2021 book, AI and Imagine Technologies in International, in international Relations. Uh, Professor Nzenze, your floor, please. Thank you. Well, uh, Vice Chancellor, Professor Mbedi, uh, our program director, and uh, all of you, our esteemed guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. With your permission, may I simply say all protocol and all excellence observed, uh, really in the interest of time, because there are many, many, many questions already online, and I'm sure seated where you are, you have burning questions yourselves. And so let us jump right into it. I've been informed of about 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, so what I'll do is take five questions to get us going. Uh, I will take three from the room and also uh, two from online where we have uh, almost 200 uh, attendees uh, joining us. So I will ask uh, when he is answering for Professor Marala to please return to the podium because uh, that we are streaming online. Yeah. Uh, 
what program director i don't know what to quite do <laughs> um i don't know what to quite do because the person to whom questions should be directed has excused yeah, himself. Yeah. <laughs> i think so i think so so can i see hands so long uh that i can recognize okay one and two and three and plenty more <laughs> all right <clears throat> Okay. <laughs> Why don't you take the questions and then when it comes back to the yeah. Okay. All right. All right. So we had a question yet, yeah, right? <laughs> Is it sorry? Ah, okay. wonderful. Okay. <laughs> so if you if you could please state your Name and affiliation and uh, your your question, please. Kasim, uh, I'm the chairperson of a technology-based fintech company called uh, Profit Share Partners. Uh, Professor Marwala, it's always wonderful and refreshing to listen to you. And you've raised many issues. If I heard you correctly, you said computational pow power is a geopolitical issue. Now. You know, I'm not a technological determinist, but I do believe in the power of technology and its transformative effects from the steam engine to the digital revolution. Now, if you look at South Africa, you said South Africa has no AI strategy, but one can go beyond that and say, what is the strategy for South Africa? South Africa, in fact, has no strategy. Our national development plan has 180 priorities. So there is really speaking no strategy. If you ask any average South African, where is this country going to, they won't give you, uh, they won't be able to give you an answer. But my question to you is, if you, if you say computational power is a geopolitical issue, and if you're looking at convergence and you touched on economic convergence, AI has the potential in terms of what you said, to narrow the convergence between the leading countries and the poor countries. So, I want to, I'll, I'll, my question to you is how can we unlock growth and the power of uh, AI to achieve uh, better convergence? Because that should be a challenge in geopolitical terms. But does it solely rest on computational power? I think it's underpinned by political will, and that is missing. So technology has transformative power, but it's, if, it's, if, it's, if it's not backed by strong political will, then we, 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 we're facing a, a, a mighty problem here. Thank you. We had a second question from the Dean of CBE. Thank you. Um, thank you, Prof, uh, for, for the lecture. Am I audible? Oh, okay. No, thank you. So you mentioned, uh, Prof Marola, data poor or and data rich status as the biggest differentiator of our times. Uh, unlike mineral wealth, I think data exists everywhere where there is life, but it may be in a format that is not readily uh, usable. I would like to get your view in terms of what infrastructure a country like South Africa needs to be able to convert the data from its raw state into 
a usable format for development purposes. Thank you. Last question for this round, uh, in person. Yes, sir. You, sir. Oh, that's the mic. Thank you. Um, is it working? Yeah. Let, let's. It, Prof, it's always wonderful to listen to you and be uh, one of your really admirers of the work that you do around the world. Um, and this question almost relates to my colleague who has just uh, uh, posed one now, the missing data. Uh, that almost points towards the African context in which the example that you provided, for instance, where it was uh, a system was not able to identify you and it identified everyone else. Now, that is massive. We, we, we try to, to minimize that, but it, in actual fact, it's massive. How are we going to extract the missing data in the African context? And we, we are beginning to push towards, especially in mathematics, I, I'm a professor of mathematics, and we, we're beginning to push towards understanding data from by developing constructs such as data science, which is becoming massive now. Colleagues at Stanford University, Joe Bola, are now, in fact, infusing that into the mathematics curriculum at high school. And I, I'm, I'm contemplating we ought to do that. While we talked about data handling at a very elementary level, in fact, it goes as far as uh, uh, high school, we pushed it as data handling, but I think we must push it into data science, which becomes fully a curriculum for everyone. But my point is, how do we interrogate the data that is missing? Which you, you gave another example of your, your, your great grandmother. She has she had that data of how best to develop that that clay pot, how to interact with that clay pot and be able to understand that I think this is weak, I think this is a strong one. How do we extricate that data? How how are we going to pull it out into the system that we are as a people? Name and affiliation. Um, ah thank you very much so we have two questions online as well uh prof mm -hmm. uh, very straightforward one wants to so this is from john Madison. is 4ir on balance a job creator or uh, a potential uh will create a potential jobs bloodbath then uh very relevant from hopalang hopalang monawa who says, can AI be used within the context of South Africa to help government deal with the problem of load shedding? So, over to you, Prof. No, 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 th 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 thank you very much for those uh, difficult questions. And of course, uh, on the issue of uh, narrowing the gap, is AI going to narrow the gap between the, uh, the, 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 the developed countries and the developing countries? What is interesting, I mean, this is the, the reality of our time. There really are only two countries that matter as far as AI is concerned today. That is United States and China. 80% uh, of all the activities in AI are actually done by United States and China. Some people are even saying 90%. So now where is Europe? Uh, in many ways, Europe has to catch up. Uh, uh, um, just think about it. There is no single company from the European Union that is bigger, that is AI company that is bigger than Alibaba or Tencent, or Google, or Facebook, you know, it's, that's the reality. If you look at the top 10 AI companies, they're mainly in the United States, but they're also in China and nowhere else. 
you know so this is a different type of 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 uh of of the divergence uh, that has emerged as a result of 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 of, uh, of these countries now let's get to the new wave that is large language models and this is how i see it english has become so important it has always been important and i and i have been studying quite 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 a bit because when you compute whether you are computing in java the syntax is written in english you know and you can almost see it you know now that i live in asia the, how 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 that these advantages other countries and disadvantages other countries now large language models they basically get this data from the internet. And I went to, uh, uh, to, 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 to Kyoto and I was talking to an expert in large language models. Says, you know, the problem is that in Japan, only 2% of written material in the internet is in Japanese. Then I asked, how about English? English is almost 60%. It's actually quite incredible when you think about it that 60% of all things in the internet are written in English. And this is going to obviously place certain parts of the world at an advantage over others. And right now it is clear uh, which part of the world is winning when it comes to this a new type of AI that is just in then become much more um, to our uh, attention. Now let's let's talk about data poor and data rich. What when I was a PhD student many many years ago, what you will do, you will take data and you will process it. Data processing was a big technology. You know how to clean the data. Uh, 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 Professor Marshall, you still remember uh, frequency domain, you take it from the time domain to the frequency domain and you still cannot see everything and you have to take it to of course uh, 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 a time frequency domain so that you can see how it is evolving in the time domain and how it is evolving in the frequency domain today because of computational power people don't do that anymore uh, the AI is doing it for them. That's something that we had to do uh, ourselves. So uh, I guess what I'm saying is, is, is saying that if you have computational power, you know, the, the data, the data processing problem, it does not exist anymore. Is it good or bad? Are we going to find the applications where we need to go back and retrain people on for their transform, I don't know, you know. Then, linked to the issue of missing data. There is a technical solution to missing data. Uh, let's just take uh, the uh, the issue of, uh, uh, and then there is a human uh, problem, which is the issue of uh, wisdom. So let's talk about the data, the, the antenatal database. The, the vector that was always, the, 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 the data that was always missing most of the time was the age of the father of the child that is unborn. It tends to be missing if the gap between the mother of the child and the father is huge. Uh, we dealt with it here in Senate. The what do you call the uh, uh, the cars that are parked outside? Uh, sugar daddies. I was sitting in this room when we were developing a strategy to deal with issues of sugar daddies. <laughs> you already know that if it is missing, it's probably because somebody is shy about it. Maybe it's because it's too long. The other uh, uh, issue was uh, income. You know, sometimes, normally, it's because it is too low and they don't want to reveal. 
So wisdom must somehow wisdom must come into the picture to be able to deal with this issue. But it's a, it's, 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 it's a difficult issue. Now, it's, it's four IRs. I don't want to use the word four IRs. I think four IRs is outdated. <laughs> and of course, they are laughing because I was here preaching four <laughs> IRs. <laughs> uh, I think, you see, people say uh, when electricity came about, the biggest problem was what is going to happen to the candle making industry and the kerosene industry. And then we know what happened, you know. Uh, and when uh, a car came, people were worried about the horse uh, breeding uh, industry, which was quite a respectable industry, you know. Uh, now the question is, in that era, these new technologies created more jobs than they have destroyed. Now, in this new era, what is going to happen? Well, the answer is we don't know. We don't know. It is clear that automation is now has now accelerated. Automation is old. I mean, I was uh, brewing beer at South African breweries when we opened the Ibai brewery that had 4,000 uh, workers and after the the automation, they could operate it with 60 people. You know, certainly the, the, the brewing process itself. And of course, uh, uh, Oyama, by the way, Oyama means blue mountain in Japanese. Blue. 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 <laughs> uh, and of course, coming from Eastern Cape, you will know that all of a sudden you started knowing few people who work for SAB. <laughs> compared to in the 80s and you know and the 70s because of the automation we don't know all we all, all we know is that it has accelerated but we know what the consequence of that is and we have actually studied the consequence of this we know that if you take too many people out of the jobs then you are going to have a problem of aggregate demand because people will simply not have disposable income to buy goods and services. And if that is the case, why? what will be the incentive to produce? Then you'll have a crisis of an economic system. And of course, quite interesting, I was reading when Elon Musk suggested universal basic income. And it was universal basic income is actually a very old concept. The first person to actually propose it was Thomas Paine. You still remember Thomas Paine? He was almost guillotined by Robespierre. You know, in fact, he was supposed to be guillotined, and then three years later, there was uh, three days later, uh, Robespierre uh, fell. So it's an old concept, and I don't think you can sustain an economic system based on uh, what do you call welfare. Uh, well, it's not ideological. This is scientific. You know, <laughs> this is a scientific uh, uh, observation. So we need to, these are the problems of our time. We need to think about them. There are no answers. Nobody has answers because we don't even know how t this technology is going to look like. You know, now load shading. Of course, you see, electricity is a very simple thing the way we are generating it. You, in South Africa, we go and get coal. I don't agree with coal, you know. We burn the coal in something called, and then uh, 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 there is water inside the boiler. It becomes very hot, and there is a steam that comes out. It moves a conductor next to a magnet. We learned that in standard eight of science, that if you have a conductor next to a magnet and you move it, electricity is generated. It was uh, uh, he was not educated at Cambridge Father Day. He was actually not educated, the person who came up for, who first observed that many, many times. It's a very simple process. Let's fix it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>
making the minister of electricity. I agree. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> so I think we can, with your permission, program director, take one final round of, of questions. So we'll take some online, uh, but uh, we'll first give uh, first preference to those who are here. So can I see some hands for this round from the program director himself? Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, I don't know if I misunderstood. Are you, am I audible? Okay. Are you suggesting that uh, basic income grant is a not something we should embrace? Because, or are you referring to it as welfare and thus not optimal? for any society. And I'm asking this question because I would have thought that um, given the kind of efficiencies that AI would inject in manufacturing, in, in just, just economic output, we could get to a point where societies are super uh, rich and, uh, and then we should, we ought to find a way you know, using those advantages that AI has generated for societies, for our economy, to make sure that basic livelihoods, you know, are maintained. Those people who are displaced, you know, like in Ebay, as you were saying, that those people who are displaced don't have to rely on crime for their livelihood. A society finds a way to make sure that there is a a floor, you know, below which no one should be allowed to fall. I thought that would have been a positive thing. Uh, uh, wonderful. Name and affiliation, please. I'm Terry Shakinovsky from Mistra. Thank you very much for such a very, very inspiring lecture. And I'm trying very hard to be what... Uh, um, Ayama called a, a true believer, and it does sound very, very wonderful what what we're being offered. But but as I listen, I wonder if the the biggest inequality is not data rich and data poor, but those who are able to develop, create, and manipulate the AI, and you know the most of the world that is left out. So the kind of inequality you're talking about, where it's America and China only that are the big firms, is that not mirrored? Um, on a smaller scale in society, where it's fewer and fewer people that are actually able to determine the world that, that we'll be inhabiting. So just a short example, I may not be a surgeon or a kidney specialist, but if there's something wrong with me, I, I could at the very least, I understand how to use a medical textbook. I could read, I could, in a way that feels absolutely beyond me certainly for, for AI. And I'm asking this, you know, we hear at the Mistra National Lecture, what about the kind of knowledge that, that Mistra represents? Will we be left out of a whole new world given, given what AI is producing and doing? Thanks, Terry. Can I get questions from the right wing, uh, please? <laughs> the left wing has dominated so far. <laughs> uh, any, <laughs> any questions uh, on my right? Okay. All right. Uh, <laughs> Prof. Tomaselli. <laughs> ah, okay. Thank you much. Uh, my name is Gosna Tintlovu, and I'm from Tech Central. Uh, my question is, is quite similar to that. Um, the recommendations given, uh, actually, if you look at them and you apply them, or you, when I think about applying them to South African society, it seems as though they would further polarize South African society instead of help us go forward. Because if we say educate South Africans on artificial intelligence, what would happen in South Africa is that a few people would gain a lot of education very quickly and a lot would get left in the dark. Uh, establish an institute, some a few people would engage with that institute and learn quickly, and then a, a lot get left in the dark. So, is there so given these recommendations, what should be prioritized to ensure that there's more inclusive growth going forward? Uh, let me take two questions from online. Uh, so, the first is from 
Tabilang Motabi from Sibanya Stillwater. And uh, 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 Tabilang says, thank you for a uh, great lecture uh, with insights and wisdom. And then uh, says, in the absence of an AI regulatory framework, um, as you said, Prof, would uh, you propose that the mining industry and the private sector in general um, implement some of the recommendations put forward by your commission, drawing from lessons learned in the use of AI in the mining sector. And then uh, final question uh, from uh, Mashutubele Mamabolo, who implies that you left some unfinished work, uh, Prof. He says that uh, I would have, you mentioned that uh, South Africa does not in, have an AI strategy. I would have thought that a commission on AI that was recently created by the president and of which uh, Prof was chair uh, was created to come up with such a strategy. Why is it that we don't have a strategy by now, despite what the commission has um, has done and has been in place for a while? Thanks. No, no, no. Thank you very much. I I just need to for those of you who have not read the history of the French Revolution. The left wing and the right wing has nothing to do with the, anything other than where you are seated. <laughs> it just so happened that uh, the Jacobins used to prefer to sit on the left hand side. Uh, and and uh, the Giro, Girondins uh, and the mountains they wanted to, stay, to sit on the other side. So uh, I mean, uh, the issue of uh, uh, the perpetual uh, 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 motion. Uh, perpetual motion was a concept where somebody actually thought you could design something that will forever generate energy. And of course, later on, we found out that energy cannot be created or destroyed, but it can only be transferred from one form to another. I think it applies to the basic, the, the concept of basic income. If you take away the concept of incentive, which is really the dominant economic system is based on incentive. Whatever, uh, whatever is going to incentivize somebody to go and create that machine that is going to do that thing. If you remove that, uh, that, that incentive, the whole uh, economic system is going to crash. Mm. Should we take care of people? Yes. But we should, our primary responsibility should be to get people on their feet. Because we do know the implications of idle, idleness on health, on mental illness, uh, health, on and so on and so forth. So it's quite important. In fact, I think it was Robert Schiller who was asked, can you summarize the whole of economics with one word? And he said, incentives. You know, with incentives, you have demand, you have uh, supply, and so on and so forth. I'm not going to get into the ideological uh, implication of what I've said. <laughs> now, that question that you raised, that is really about the technology, about uh, not, not necessarily data. You see, the, uh, the world has changed. When uh, uh, Professor Mashao was, was at Brown University writing, doing AI, he wrote everything himself, isn't it? When I was doing a PhD, we wrote many things, but not everything. It was numerical recipes. You still remember that it had come to the picture. Today, all the alg algorithms are available for free. Uh, Google has something called TensorFlow. It has all the algorithms available. But somebody says, there is nothing for free. All they are doing is to, to incentivize you to develop apps on their platform, the same way they did with uh, Android. That's the, that's the same process. You know. But I think the technology itself, certainly the algorithms themselves, 
are no longer a point of competition because you can download almost all the algorithms on the internet. What is the biggest thing is data. Data is actually what, what differentiates somebody who has a system that can be able to write essays and the system that can't write essays. You know, of course, you, that data must be processed or you need computational power and so on and so forth. You know. So the AI race has really become the race for two things are defining the AI race. Access to data and access to, to the, the computing power that you need to use the algorithms that are freely available to create, to, 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 to make sense or to create systems that are going to do things, generate or predict. Now, the fourth industrial revolution commission uh, recommendation I always, I, I said, I will say this, you know, life is always a tale of two cities. Uh, the responsibility of good leadership is to design mechanisms to ensure that uh, whatever comes out of whatever recommendation you are dealing with, you take care of the greatest number of people is called the principle of utilitarianism, you know. And of course, there are sciences that have been developed to create mechanisms. And I'm not, I don't like to be, uh, uh, Wongani was telling me that I am a PR machine. <laughs> I don't agree with Wongani, you know. Uh, but there is a book on mechanism design and artificial intelligence that is available on Amazon. Go and buy it. <laughs> it will tell you how to design systems that are able to have a particular outcome. I'm not going to reveal the author here. <laughs> <laughs> now, the mining industry. I think it has to automate. I think I think there is uh, somebody was telling me that there used to be a statement in Japan that says that it is immoral to 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 require people to do that which can be done by a machine, especially if the point at which these people are supposed to operate, this is known to be a dangerous place. I used to have a red ticket, by the way. Uh, for those of you in the mining industry, you'll know what a red ticket is. Is you will go to a doctor, they will take an examination and they say you can go down. Uh, uh, just after my undergrad, I worked for CSIR Mining Tech and I had to get a red ticket. You know? It's a dangerous place, it's humid. And I think the mining industry must automate. It's a very difficult automation because the robot there is on rocks. There is lots of humidity. And in mechanical engineering, if there's humidity, you know rust is the consequence of that, which means things are not going to move as efficiently and so on and so forth. We need to understand that it's a much, much more difficult place to automate than an assembly line at, a, at an automotive um, company. The AI commission, was it supposed to, was in the 4IR, no, 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 the 4IR commission was not supposed to come up with an AI strategy. Because the fourth industrial revolution involves things like blockchain that that have all their own issues. It, it involved issues like uh, internet of things, artificial intelligence, and so on and so forth. And biotechnology, so it was, uh, we were trying to, uh, uh, to craft a path for, uh, for, for the group of technologies. And we are saying that this technology, one technology, which is artificial intelligence, is actually supposed to be uh, taken seriously given the sort of gains that it has made. So thank you very much. No more questions. Thank you very much for inviting me. I am glad. <laughs>
Wow, 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 wow. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the summit of our evening. And the person who will close this evening is our executive director, Joel Katu Nechitenze. Um, those who don't know him, he has a master of science degree in financial economics and a postgraduate diploma in economic principles from the University of London, as well as a diploma in political science from the Institute of Social Sciences in Moscow, also known as the Lenin School. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, program director and chair of uh, our Council of Advisors. I should also acknowledge the other leaders of MISTRA, uh, the board and the council on this occasion of our annual lecture. And uh, thank you to the vice chancellor, Professor Liklokwa Mupedi, and other leaders of the University of uh, Johannesburg who have graced this occasion. Uh, Professor Marwala, listening to you today, one has come to a fuller understanding that a phenomenon that many of us thought was a, a few years, if not decades away, is actually manifesting in real life today. And so perhaps the words of uh, Ernest Hemingway come to mind. He was talking about a different issue altogether, bankruptcy. And to paraphrase him, how did you get into the era of artificial intelligence? Two ways, gradually, and then suddenly. So it is precisely this apparent suddenness that motivated us as Mistra to have this lecture today. And it would seem that all these complex systems and their complex nomenclature are permeating the entirety of human life in both open and insidious ways. And for the uninitiated like myself, we discover their presence in our lives after the fact. And so your assessment of this curate's egg is both worrying and reassuring. You have warned us about the disastrous consequences that can emanate from AI, but you also reassure us that uh, AI can be used to improve the human condition. As you advise the issues how to use artificial intelligence to complement and enhance human capabilities and how to ensure collaboration in innovation and in changing the regulatory ecosystem. For those of us in research institutes and universities in the think industry, I think the challenge is how to ensure that uh, we have a transdisciplinary treatment of artificial intelligence as it evolves. And also importantly, how to use artificial intelligence for human benefit without regard to social status, gender, geographic location, language, race, and so on. So thank you once again for a free lecture that uh, has, I think, clarified to all of us the opportunities as well as 
the perils that are attached to this technology. And your treatment of this complex issue in a manner that ordinary mortals uh, can understand, I think underlines the profundity of your appreciation of the science. Sometimes I think the saying that uh, familiarity breeds contempt does find expression in situations such as today in the sense that because we know you, because you are a friend and a peer to many of us and because you are easygoing, we tend to forget what a great asset you are, Prof, to South Africa and to humanity at large. We wish you all the best in your endeavors as a, the Undersecretary of the Secretary General of the United Nations. And we are reassured because of the work that you are undertaking at the United Nations University that you are not lost to Africa, you are not lost to South Africa, and should I add, you are not lost to UJ and you are not lost to Mistra. We should also express our appreciation to the respondents, Dr. Rifilwe Lipere and Arthur Goldstack, as well as the discussion facilitator, Professor Bason Zenze, and to all the participants both here and on the virtual platform. We are also indebted to the organizing team from both Mistra and UJ, including our PR agency 2807, as well as Yellow Woods, who sponsored the occasion. We do hope that next year's Mapungubwe lecture will largely be physical so that we can more directly revive the friendships that used to exist before COVID. So thank you to everyone, both here and on the virtual platform. The lesson has been internalized, I think not only by myself, but all the participants, that what you need to do is to think about human benefit. Technology should just complement that. Thank you my, very much to everyone. <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> refreshments are served, colleagues. <laughs>